So, uh, I'm Mike Shaver, I'm from Mozilla. Um, I've been doing Mozilla for 12 years in various capacities. Um, most recently managed engineering for three years from the end of Firefox 3 through the ship of Firefox 4. Um, about 200 people spread around the world, uh, of which eight were in the office I was in, um, and 15 were in my time zone. So I have a lot of experience growing and managing teams through all sorts of unnatural communication technologies. Um, I've done web technology, obviously. I've done large-scale uh, high-performance file systems and some privacy stuff as well. Generally interested in helping people get more value out of the web and contribute more value to the web. Um, so uh, I'm happy to I mean, spend half an hour answering questions, or I can sort of freestyle for a little while, speaking too quickly. I'm on jet lagged and all up on caffeine, so I apologize for the people for whom uh, English isn't the first language. You can get subtitles on the video later or something. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm, here, I'm here at SeedCamp um, both because it's really fucking fascinating, uh, but also to help uh, the startups and the teams take better advantage of the web, see where their things can, can connect to things that are going on in, in those areas. So I mean, I'll start there and see if anybody has any questions to rescue me here, um, but they don't. So some things I've learned about managing engineers. Um, first piece is that you, you ship your team. Uh, the way you're special, I mean, it, you're at the scale now, you're three to five, you know, or one to five people, where's, where's Patrick there, one. Um, and, and so you're, you're really tightly coupled, though in some cases I know you're in, in different geographies. Um, that will be reflected in your software. Uh, it'll be reflected in the user experience, it'll be reflected in the places where your software falls apart, will be at those join points between systems, and they tend to be the join points between the parts of the organization. So you need to pay special attention to those. Uh, rotating people between groups has helped. There's no substitute for spending some time face to face. So as you t if you're in multiple areas, as you take your funding, as you put that budget together, put a meaningful chunk aside to get together in one place frequently to, re to rebuild those, those social and face to face connections. Um, those are things that I underestimated a lot when I started running engineering, right? We're all in Bugzilla, we're all communicating over text, we're all programmers or, t or you know, in QA or security staff. Our, our currency is software, we should be able to just do this with text which is great, except that building software these days is fundamentally a social activity. You can't do it generally by yourself, maybe Patrick an exception, done it a couple times by himself. Um, but to get to scale and to build things that need different kinds of expertise, you really need to be able to have good relationships that have a lot of trust in them and that have a lot of, a lot of nuance. It's easy to forget there's a person on the other side of it. Um, one of the, um, some gentleman whose name I've forgotten now and who isn't here for me to point at, collecting books from mentors and so forth, people to read, and the, the number one choice there for me was a book on cognitive dissonance called Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, um, which is actually probably gonna be on my, my tombstone. Um, and, and the reason I found it so valuable in managing engineering was that it's really easy, especially with very technical people, to get backed into a position. And the model you know, in, in the brain is I'm, I'm a good engineer, or I'm a good marketer, I'm a good UX designer, I'm a good you know, biz dev person, I'm a good CEO, so this decision I made or this place I got us to must be the right one because if it's not, then I'm bad at what I do. And the, the brain just can't hold those pieces together. Cognitive dissonance uh, causes a lot of problems for us. So the book is very helpful in both recognizing when that's happening and providing some tools for getting out of it. it both, I, I was hoping, you know, it'll help me get my engineers out of these positions they, they get into historically or they've publicly s stated their support for and now they feel they need to back up. But it's actually really useful for me too in spotting these behaviors in myself. Uh, when you're going fast, you're making a lot of decisions quickly, you're investing deeply in these things, you've got an initial product concept, got an initial business concept, and the, the pivot is sort of a classic thing that, that gets, you know, that has, you have to fight over the cognitive distance to get to even pitching this idea for ages. You know, it may not be, it may turn out to not be quite the right idea, and being able to be, to have some systems for getting past that, pretty valuable. Um, uh, technology uh, pieces, I think one of the things that we've seen uh, a lot of motion on in the last, certainly in the last sort of six months, but even I think it goes back farther than that. Um, the mobile, mobile landscape is both really valuable and really painful to develop for right now. Um, there's sort of two and a half stacks, the, you know, the Apple silo and the Android sort of semi-silo, and then kind of Blackberry, if you're in the right market, you care about that. Windows Phone 7, um, which I think will ship on an, a meaningful number of devices. Um, and so you know, we're, see, we're obviously interested in the web being an app development platform for mobile. Um, but whatever you, you do there, you need to be um, ready to ride out a pretty fragmented market, I think. Uh, and that's got technical challenges, it's got tooling challenges, um, and, so, and that's, a, that's a big concern there. So the, the last thing I'll say about um, 
and then you have to ask me questions, or I'm going to start just randomly calling on you. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah, Dave, that's good. Um, <laughs> The other thing is that uh, you, know, you, man you manage what you measure, and there's almost no better way to get engineers to do things than to put a number on it. Um, you know, when we, we, you know, after we'd shipped Firefox 3 and uh, leading up to 3.5, Chrome came out that, that Labor Day, so three years ago today maybe, um, it changed the world for us, right? We'd been focusing on things that, we've been focusing on a lot of stuff, which is to say not focusing. One of those pieces was certainly performance, but they put a stake in the ground on it that we had to fight to, to catch up to. And the biggest piece of that was just a graph that showed how far apart we were. Right? We had this site, are, you fast, are we fast yet? And for a while it just said no. Right? Those lines hadn't crossed, and that was, that was the goal, was to make them cross. Um, it wasn't enough to set a specific numerical target. We didn't have to argue about how many milliseconds it took to run the test. We put Chrome on the line, we put ourselves on the line. They got better, we had to get better by more, and we eventually crossed those lines. Um, and now we're looking at how to expand that to other aspects of the product we care about, responsiveness, the initial startup, what the user experience is on installing add-ons and so forth. So if you can measure it, measure it, because it lets you spend more of your valuable judgment time on the things you can't measure. The stuff that you measure, it's easy to tell how you're doing. You can put it in your board deck. You can see whether it, you know, you can A-B yourself back and forth on it. Um, you're gonna, there are going to be things you have to do that, that aren't amenable to sort of quantification that way. Save all, your, save all of the, the brain glucose you can for that, that side of the world uh, and measure everything you can there especially for the perspective of motivating engineers. And I guess sales guys are the same way, right? Tell them it's five bucks for a rock, you get a lot of rocks. Tell them it's 10 bucks for red rock, you get a lot more red rocks than other rocks. Um, but engineers are the same way. Put a number in front of them, you're good to go. Um, asking for a little more detail, unpacking the, the mobile stack sort of split and so forth. Um, and with the first caveat that um, I don't have the numbers exactly to hand, my sense is, You've got, you've got two major stacks, you know, iPhone and Android. I think iPhone is going to be smaller but easy, easier to monetize because there are people who tend to be less price sensitive. We're going to see Android be the, the, they would hate me for saying this, sort of the Windows, uh, you know, ubiquity play there. Certainly from the carrier side, we're seeing more uptick, more, more interest in it. Um, you're right to, and then the sort of the half stack, which is sort of the combined weight right now of, of uh, BlackBerry and, uh, and Windows Phone 7. Um, they'll probably, I don't think BlackBerry's going to grow a lot, to be honest, uh, but Windows Phone 7 will. So, but there's a, you raise another sort of secondary point. Um, and so the relative distribution there, I think that, um, I think it's, I think it, in terms of, I forget whether it's like app sales or total revenue, it's pretty much neck and neck globally between uh, iPhone and the, and the Android set, um, as I understand it right now. I don't know how that breaks down by geography, but it's, that's a, a very important question. Um, the other piece, though, is that you have multiple Android stacks in a couple senses. We, we have pain here from developing Firefox for Android. Um, which CPUs are there? How much memory is there? It's a, it's a much broader set of, of variables, right? It's sort of the console gaming, console game development versus PC game development. The console, you know, you know, this is what an Xbox 360 looks like. You program to it. How it runs in my lab is how it runs for the customer. PC gaming, you know, much farther apart. And that's, the, that's an important iPhone versus Android piece. But you also have this split, I think, in iOS as well, between handsets and tablets. Um, and for some, for some app experiences, one of those is going to be primary. You've got a lot of data to, to present, a lot of you know, detailed interaction. The tablet form factor makes more sense. Um, but targeting both of the, you know, there's a big split there, and that prioritizing that's going to be important. Um, from, my, from my perspective, you know, this is one of the reasons we're investing a bunch in, in mobile on the web, is we're seeing interest from developers, and I don't know whether that's as much the case here, um, who want you know, a, a sort of a vendor neutral open stack they can build to. Um, and we have one, it's called the web. It doesn't get deep enough into the devices, but it, right now well, people are working on that. Um, and that's the kind of thing that sort of makes you future proof. But it doesn't give you the, right now, the tightly integrated UI experience. And that's one of the perils. I mean, this was Apple's big point about not wanting Flash on there and, and these compiled, compiled down tools. You want an, a great native experience. You want integration to all these things. So if you're looking to build cross-platform stuff, you want to probably do a, a custom UI shim for each platform on top. Um, if, I were not, if I were launching a new mobile company right now, um, I would target the most recent Android devices and two and a half generations or maybe three generations of iPhone in terms of the set of people who are likely to spend money on it, um, in terms of not having to worry about performance characteristics on older Android devices uh, and narrowing that, that spectrum a little bit. Um, but uh, I'm not the one running a mobile company, so check yourself on that.
Dave asking about sort of the demographic segmentation there, um, you know, kids and family, the, the teen or tween chunk, and then adult, which I, I presume you no, don't mean like, expli like explicit sexual content, but like people who've graduated from, from college. But even then, right? Put that on the, put that on the iPad, that's my advice. Um, so, uh, so one interesting thing we've, we've seen, and I should dig up some of this, some of this research, um, not, not first party to Mozilla, but well, well curated by somebody in our, our product group, um, if I had to pick a device to target for uh, kids, I would target the iPad. Is that an iPad? I can't tell from here. It's lights in my eyes. But yes, either an iPad or one of the few Android tablets Dave would touch. Um, so I would target the iPad for that kind of space. I think uh, Android devices, as you get as you get older, and I and probably iPhone in the um, in that delicious 18 to 25 monetizable range, um, just because at that point there's more of a fashion sensitivity. Um, and, and there's some of the, and that's more they're likely to see the, the peer pressure people who are getting a, a new, their first smartphone is likely to be Android because if, if they're buying their first smartphone, they're pretty price sensitive and they'll get what the carrier gives them. Places that are most more price sensitive effectively are going to skew towards Android and places where you, where they're dealing with more with local manufacturers and carriers than the global sort of Apple environment are definitely skewing towards Android. You really want like our mobile product manager up here, but I talk to them a lot, so I'll, I'll riff on that. Um, other, yes. Yes, I rec the floor recognizes, yes. Okay. The question is, you said you were managing uh, eight people in the office, 15 people in the office. Can you tell us a little bit more about those dynamics? Oh, so I... Sort of that kind of problem that you have to stick together to really a scrub that speed. Yeah. But at a certain point in time, you have to split into more offices. Yeah. So that's a good problem to have. When you're big enough to have to split, that's great. Buy yourself a beer. But, so I missed spoke before. I was managing... I was, the engineering organization I was running was 200 people globally. So I had a very, meant to say, a very small fraction of those that I was close to or even sort of slept the same hours as. Um, there are good tools for, yank, just yank me off with the hook anytime. Um, there are some good tools for communicating here. Video is now viable pretty much everywhere, including on handsets. Um, so that's something we don't use enough of and I wish we used more. We have cross-platform, some you know, Linux developers and so forth that, that have trouble with that. Um, whether it's Skype or it's Google Hangout or it's, uh, the Facebook, you know, Facebook chat pieces, um, any of these other, uh, you know, Voxio, um, audio. We have, we did, one of the things we did was put uh, ambient TVs. So we just, like, some cheap old iMac or whatever and put it in the kitchen on each side and had a permanent Skype connection between it. So you get some sense of, like, oh, all these, you know, it's loud over there. Somebody can just walk by and you have some ambient chat. Um, the video makes a huge difference. If I had to do it over again, I would... Uh, I would have somebody go by every engineer's desk once an hour and remind them that they can pick up a phone. Because once you're not there, it's just different picking up a phone and calling somebody versus being able to pop by their desk. But again, ambient video helps with some of that. You see they're up in the kitchen, you can interrupt them with something. Um, so that would be my advice, uh, mostly there. And then, yeah, travel. Even if it's just go to the other, you know, you don't have to all get together, but you do have to intermix and you have to reinforce those social relationships. I've got one question. Yes. Um, so you just talked about when Google released Chrome. How was that a big kind of jolt for the organization and how surprised were you by that and what did it do um, just in terms of the, the, the thinking about the product and just yeah. in general? When, when Chrome was announced, I'd been VP of engineering for about six weeks. So I was like, thank you, previous VP of engineering. <laughs> um, so uh, without disclosing any confidence, we'd known Chrome or something like it was coming for some time, though not the timing of it. I think we knew before pretty much anybody else in Google, actually, because um, we'd been collaborating with them on, on the browser, and they didn't want to, to their credit, they didn't want to totally blindside us. Um, it was a wake up. There were, there were a couple things that were interesting there. I mean, obviously, the performance piece. Um, it was clear we needed to, to compete on that. It caused a lot of tension and stress in our UX group, um, because amongst the most sort of visible and audible uh, sets of users, right? The tastemakers. They were all very interested in the in the extremely minimal, um, you know, Omnibox and so forth, um, and that created some some tension for us. About you know, we we at that point had 350 million users. We have about half a billion now, uh, and the kinds of things you can do when you don't have an existing user base are very different from the kinds of things you can do where you've got to worry about the effects on that existing user base. Um, Chrome was definitely a wake up call. I think I think some people over those those you know first few months had to change their pants a few times. Uh, it was, it was, you know, it, as I was saying, it's exactly, it's the product you would expect if you, uh, if you were Google, you wanted to build a great web browser that really focused on, um, you know, moving pixels from the, from the, the server and moving events back, right? It was really designed to maximize the app area and the app experience. 
uh, or apps control of the experience, uh, which fits with what sort of you know what Google's general strategy is, um, and if you had a lot of resources to throw at it. So that was the point where. Uh, so I used to. Are there Microsoft people in the room? Anybody? Even X Microsoft from sort of that critical 2005 through. No. Okay. Good. So I can tell the story. Um, <laughs> So when we, were, when we were building up to Firefox 3, it was sort of like one of those sort of B-movie martial arts movies. Like we could compete with Microsoft with one hand, eat a sandwich with the other one, because they weren't really doing much in the browser. And it's reasonable, right? You, it, that's what it was. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and I mean, it, you can imagine being the guy that runs IE and saying, hey, this scrappy nonprofit is starting to eat in my market share. Like, here's a nickel. Go buy yourself some marketing. It's fine, right? Um, and it's very different when they say, hey, Google's trying to eat our application business by getting to the desktop in front of these developers and users. It's like back up the trucks of money. Um, so it was a very different competition model. We were able to do these things that, that improve the app all the time, but we also spent a lot of our energy on speculative stuff around the web platform. You know, we, we had a lot of leftover bandwidth after the, the competitive pieces had been spent. Um, and with Chrome, that wasn't the case anymore. Uh, and with IE9, I think it's been a, you know, it, uh, I used to say that the, the Mozilla accomplishment I was most proud of was IE7 that we got Microsoft to put the team back together, and all these people who would never have known Firefox if we came up and bit them uh, got a better browser experience. And as a nonprofit charter to improve the web, that's great, right? We see a, a competi our competitive environment's a little different than many of yours will be. Um, but yeah, I mean, Chrome changed the stakes in a number of ways. It, it brought a lot of more people awareness that they had a choice of web browser and what the hell a web browser was. Um, and there's that great you know, Google uh, product management video interviewing people with web browsers. It was really terrifying for us at the time, but it, it was useful, um, and, it, and it also provided an opportunity, though, sort of once we got over our initial shock and terror. Uh, <laughs> that's overstated, but yeah. Um, it, provides another, it provides another sort of triangulation point on the web. Right? It's, there's a different kind of experience people can have if they want that. But, so it gives us some freedom. I think we haven't fully used it yet to say, hey, we're not going to try and be everything to everybody anymore. Right? It used to be that if you didn't use Firefox, you used IE7, and that wasn't really a fit we wanted to leave anybody to. So you. And even the IE team will tell you IE7 was not their greatest work. Um, so at that point, we had to be very broad. But now it's like, hey, if you don't use Firefox, you use Chrome. That's great. You use Safari. Mostly great. It's a great, web, great layout engine with a terrible, in my opinion, app wrapped around it. Or use IE9, which you know, that's, that's a long way from abandoning people to IE7 and IE8. So we're now able to, to shrink in what we haven't done it yet, I think, as, as much as we, we will in the future, but shrink in the, the sets of things we're going to address. So somebody asked the WebKit question. Um, <laughs> does it make sense to have three, really five, uh, rendering engines? Um, or could you just collaborate on one is easier for developers? So I have two stories, and then I'll answer your question. Um, first story is we already had that. It was called IE6. It sucked because people built stuff to the specific implementation, and it meant you couldn't build another browser and enter the market. You had to do all the things that IE6 had done. And the thing that one of the things we value about the web is that people can build, can actually build a new browser. That Chrome was able to create a new browser with their forked version of WebKit. That Apple was able to create a new browser when they started from KHTML was a sign that we'd made a huge amount of progress moving people off of the IE6 dependent stuff. And I think as new things get added to the web platform, which is happening faster than it ever has before, even in the Microsoft Netscape deathmatch days, um, it's really important that those things be interoperable and that there be multiple directions to pull it on. The other piece is that you're never going to have one rendering engine, even if you all worked initially from a common source base. You look at sort of people talk about like running WebKit, but it's really like which WebKit. So like the WebKit on the iPhone is different from the WebKit on desktop. The WebKit on the iPad is actually kind of different from the, de from the, the version in, on the handset in some, some ways that are meaningful to developers. Right? They get, developers find these things ambiently. They don't have to go and look for them. Um, the version that's in Safari is very different from the one that's in Google's Chrome in terms of what they, su what they surface to users. Do you have a native client? Do you have 3D transforms? Do you have them on Windows? Do you have them on the Mac? So there's sort of, a, a, I think, a fiction there that we could all run the same source base and then, and then worry about other stuff. Um, so that's sort of one story-ish. The other one is, I was speaking at um, Harvard Business School with a, a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, talking about, they did a case study on the Firefox launch and the decision about how to build a deal with Google that matched our principles and still supported the, the, the model. Um, and we were noticing it. We've noted, actually commented that, that neither, this school would never have admitted either of us. So it was pretty sweet we get to go and kind of have that. Um, but it was, a, it was an executive education session for a bunch of CIOs, so you know, banks and petroleum companies and whatever else. And one of them said it was a lot easier for us in terms of our development budget when we only had to support one browser. And uh, what I said, which was not extremely well received, was my job is not to make that easier. My job is not to make it easier for the company providing that technology to 
or just give them my, my perspective on it. My job is not to make it easier for those people to, uh, to build technology by taking away users' choices, right? Those users could still use that, that platform if they wanted. If they'd had a choice before, they would have done this thing differently. It was an artificial restriction on sort of the marketplace of ideas to only have this one set of choices. Um, there's also, I mean, there's also sort of this traffic control problem, right? If you look at the Google, Apple dynamics around WebKit, um, it's, it's kind of messy, right? I mean, they, they, if, you, if you follow the, the check-in pattern history, you follow like where the reviews come from and so forth, it's clear there's a lot of tension there in terms of the direction of the product. I mean, they, they still have their own JavaScript engines, for example, because they have very different approaches to that stuff. Um, so I, th I think this is also true for uh, commoditization of, the plat of platforms in general. So there's some pieces here, you know, this, uh, the oust.me guys are basically looking to commoditize the location check-in based services and applications, make those generic for purposes of building some additional value layer on top of it. Um, and that's great, but if you look at what those services are, they're actually a little bit different, right? There's, they're connected to things in a different way. Some of them are bidirectional, some of them are public, some of them are private. Um, it's easy to sort of look at it from a, and I, as a developer, I'm like, why do I have, you know, I did, I've done cross-platform software my entire career. So it's like, why don't you guys all fucking implement POSIX, right? Why do you, why is this thing, why is, it, why is the drag and drop API in Linux synchronous where it's asynchronous on the Mac? Um, those kinds of things drive you nuts. But commoditizing that stuff down really restricts the kinds of things you can do, right? If you look at the BIOS and driver layer, layer stuff that we've had in PCs for ages, people are really constrained there in terms of what they can do. They have horribly slow boot times because they have to do all these timeout-based things. They're not able to make those changes, and it really limits what people can do there. So uh, I think it's easier to overestimate how, how similar technology stacks of that complexity are. So, so yeah, so market share, um, talking about market share trends, and I think actually it's, well, it depends on how you measure it, but, um, because they don't really measure users, you measure usage, and so there's a skew, like a Chrome user probably browses about three times as much as the average Firefox user, just because of this, the relative size and target of the market. Um, but that's fine, it doesn't really matter. It, uh, so, so there's certainly things we could do on the engineering side, or that engineering could do, now that I'm off in tech strategy land, or just kinda, I'm just an idea guy now. Um, that, that we could do that, you know, there's always, there's always things you can do to improve the product that will, that will move that stuff. I think, and I hope, what we're actually headed towards is a triple point on the web, where you've got approximately, say, 30% uh, each of Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla. And that provides a really healthy tension towards both interoperability, because no one's gonna build content for, that, that walks away from that much of the stuff, um, and provides a lot of ways to build this standard, these standards that can run in different environments, right? Can it run on a tablet? Can it run on five different operating systems? These kinds of things. Um, I think that's a really healthy state for the web. We're seeing that, I think the, one of the first pl large places we'll see that is actually Brazil, where we're sort of trending towards that right now. We could see that in some European countries. Um, Chrome's having some harder time with traction in some of those cases, Germany especially. Uh, but, but I think we'll sit there. So, I mean, it was unlikely that we were going to, you know, continue the curve up to 60%, and it was, it's really unlikely that when, you know, in any product environment, when a company like Google comes in and leans into it with however many hundreds of people, I have a guess, um, pretty educated guess, uh, that it wasn't gonna affect the market, right? It was, it was, as much as they talk about, you know, taking users from IE, the kinds of people who were likely to switch browsers had already switched to Firefox. Um, so, so that, and that's, that's fine. I mean, you want more market share, you wanna do that, but I think we can still achieve our mission of influencing the direction of the web with even materially less market share than we have now. But it is a nice metric to use to keep score, and we watch it pretty closely, especially regionally, to see where we're not impacting the direction of the web in a given geography. And that's stuff that we, we pay a lot of attention to. That answer was too long to take another question, wasn't it? I think that was all right. Okay. Um, so more is questions there from Dave. any more pressing question from the audience? If not, I think we can thank Mike with a warm applause. That was very insightful. <laughs>